Stan Kenton died 24 years ago this month. He was 68. In this tribute to the pianist and bandleader, the emphasis is on his output between 1950 and 1955, a period that remains a high point in the Kenton canon. Over those five years, the leader had many gifted musicians pass through his organization, including trumpeters Maynard Ferguson, Shorty Rogers, Conti Candoli, and Buddy Childers, trombonists Milt Bernhardt and Frank Rossellino, saxophonists Lee Konitz, Charlie Mariano, Art Pepper, Bud Shank, Bob Cooper, Zoot Sims, and Bill Perkins, drummers Shelley Mann, Mel Lewis, and Stan Levy. In 1950, Kenton had been leading a band for ten years. I reminisce about the beginnings. There was an experimental rehearsal with 11 musicians in Los Angeles in, in 1940. I believed in the musicians I had called, and they reflected enough positive reaction to the music I had written to, to urge me further. At the top, there were bands like Benny Goodman, there was Glenn Miller, Artie Shaw, the Lunsford Band, and of course, uh, Duke Ellington. In our first public appearances in 1941, our jazz, like that of the big names, was fitted into dance music. You know, in that era, people stood and listened, or they danced, because none of the jazz at that time was too complex rhythmically for dance music. It was the beginning of the jitterbugs, and they, as well as most of the dancers, they liked to beat. So at the Rendezvous Ballroom in Balboa Beach, California, with men like Jack Ordine, Red Doris, Chico Alvarez, and Howard Rumsey, we played a music that sounded like this. There were a lot of sharp accented offbeats, many improvised solos, and most introductions, endings, and interludes were like powerful brass fanfares. I guess we played at top pitch all the time because, well, we were young, and I am sure we wanted to be noticed. Three years followed this, with not much progress musically or otherwise. We, like all other young jazz orchestras, were either too loud, too fast, uh, too slow, or worse yet, what we were playing sounded like nonsense because there were no popular songs and we were very short on hit parade material. We made many trips from the Palladium in Hollywood to the Meadowbrook in Jersey, the Panther Room in Chicago, and stops in between. We had our share of cancellations, criticisms, and I guess we had our average amount of abuse, but as I look back on it now, I realize that what we were having was actually just considered normal growing pains. During this period, we tried many types of music and experimented continually in an effort to appease the ballroom men, the hotel operators, agents, radio networks, our recording company, and of course, the music publishers. Forgetting about the jazz format for the moment, we tried to create a sweet commercial style. We had Gene Howard singing the ballad. When you're near, there's such an air of spring. We had Anita Day doing the rhythm tunes. Like a stab in the back, she found out they were not hers. And I guess the few contributions we made to jazz during that period, well, maybe the most important was Eager Beaver. Somehow, out of all the confusion, I realized that two important developments had taken place. First, though we had drifted far from our course and struggled continually for simple survival, we had weathered the heaviest storm, that of getting started. And second, our attempts at musical appeasement would never be the answer. Though the band was now past the dangers of infancy, I knew we should never go further unless we returned to our original purpose, jazz. We relieved the library of every gimmick experiment and started blowing again with the same conscientiousness that we had in the beginning. And as if by magic, interest in the music, instead of hanging out pathetically, began to soar. September 1945 found us at the Cafe Rouge in the Hotel Pennsylvania, New York. The band had grown in personnel. Now we had four trumpets instead of three, and of course we had four trombones instead of two. Once again, we were working with brass and the great excitement that comes from brass. You know, the wonderful Woody Herman band at that time had just been accepted by the people playing our most exciting jazz. 
thereby rekindling our belief and enthusiasm in our own conception of music. So, again with men like Eddie Safransky, Kay Winding, Buddy Childers, Vito Musso, Boots Mazzulli, and of course June Christie, we contributed artistry jumps. Painted rhythm. Pico, and then came our first album, Artistry and Rhythm. In a year or so, we started breaking attendance records, and our record sales became big. This continued until the spring of 1947, when gratified by the public's enthusiasm, but utterly exhausted, we dissolved the band for a six months rest. By now, the music of Artistry and Rhythm was firmly established. I began to realize the vast possibilities of the sound of the jazz musician. With Kay Winding Strabone, for instance, we found that we could create great character even without the presence of a rhythm section setting a beat. A good example was the sound created on Gene Rowland's Ain't No Misery in Me. This to me opened a new field. We now had complete freedom with the jazz emotion. We could write our music in any movement because besides setting it to a swing beat, we had the advantages of gaining contrast and freshness even without tempo. So in 1947, with the addition of Shelley Mann, Lorendo Almeida, Milt Bernhardt, Ray Wetzel, Jack Costanza, George Weidler, and of course Bob Cooper, our music that was now called progressive jazz managed to succeed in our first concert tour and our first album of the music. That was Rugolo's Impressionism. The concerto to end all concertos. The Cuban influence became prevalent in Cuban carnival and machito. Then there was Elegy for Aldo and, of course, many others. The enthusiasm for progressive jazz renewed our faith in the necessity to keep moving forward with, with our music. Concerts were strained financially and required periodic returns to hotels and ballrooms to help support them. But the interest of our listeners was unmistakable, and our own integrity demanded that this interest be justified and encouraged. Believing in the importance of jazz as an expression of the American people, we inaugurated a series of concerts in 1950 known as Innovations in Modern Music. With every conceivable advantage offered by 40 musicians, including strings, horns, and woodwinds, our music took on almost a classical aspect. While it was still jazz, we brought in the formerly educated creative talents of such men as Franklin Marks, Johnny Richards, Bob Grettinger, and of course again Pete Rugolo, and presented to the serious jazz listener such widely varied compositions as Trajectories, Soliloquy, Incident in Jazz, and of course Mirage. (laughs) 